cette, séance, cette, cette présentation euh, et sera donnée par Claudio Calosi qui malheureusement a été empêché de, de venir d'être des nôtres euh, par un problème de santé mais qui a eu quand même l'amabilité d'enregistrer son intervention euh, sur une vidéo et donc c'est cette vidéo que euh, nous allons diffuser. Euh, donc je présente quand même en son absence Claudio Calossi pour les personnes qui ne le connaissent pas. Claudio Calossi euh, est euh, actuellement postdoctorant à l'université de Neuchâtel en Suisse et il travaille essentiellement euh, dans les domaines de la euh, philosophie de la physique et euh, de la métaphysique analytique. Il a notamment édité euh, un livre sur la métaphysique de la composition qui s'appelle Mariology and the Sciences qui a été publié par euh, Springer. Donc, euh, voilà, je vais lancer la vidéo et laisser la parole à Claudio en son absence. Hi, um, I'm Claudio, and um, unfortunately, I cannot be there in person with you today. Apparently, I've become a burden to my own flesh, so I have to do this uh, via video. Uh, but I've been told actually that Grand Priest uses this technique, so I'm feeling very priestesque right now, and I'm ready to embrace contradictions uh, and say, I contradict myself, I contain multitudes. Okay, enough with the Walt Whitman. Uh, let's jump right into it because video is a little bit more difficult to follow than in presentations in person. So we're going to talk about a particular metaphysical thesis known as uh, composition as identity. Uh, So the structure of the talk is pretty simple. We're going to introduce composition as identity. In particular, we're going to introduce uh, logical and semantical principles underpinning this metaphysical thesis. And then in section two, I will put forward two arguments to the point that no version of so-called strong composition as identity can retain uh, the strength of both the logic and the semantical principle we saw in section one. Now, the arguments are new, so they're not the, the usual one you're, you're used to in the literature, uh, and they seem straightforward, but it turns out, or so I will contend, that um, they, uses, they use an implicit assumptions about uh, pluralities and plural referring expressions that should be challenged by friends of composition as identity theories. And this is the work we will be doing in section three. This is much work in progress with Thomas Satic, so any comments, questions, suggestions on this section will be particularly helpful. You can write me anytime. And then we will actually, uh, a brief conclusion will follow. Okay, so let's start a little bit informally just to give you, um, let's say, a landscape. So composition as identity is the thesis that a whole is strict and literally just its parts considered collectively. So it says that one thing, the whole, can be identical to many things considered together, the parts. Now, why do you want to actually engage seriously with such a thesis? Well, you, have, you might have different reasons. One is that, for example, it has a fantastic philosophical pedigree. So if you see the, um, all, um, all the works that you have in the slides actually discuss uh, a thesis in the vicinity of composition as identity. Now, not all the works endorse it, but some of them do. In fact, for example, Hobbes is uh, pretty, pretty clear about that. Um, another, another answer, um, another reason, sorry, uh, to actually engage with this thesis seriously is just that it answers uh, metaphysical problems. So, for example, think about uh, inheritance of location. So, usually, I mean, not usually, almost always, Um, so parts are located where the whole is located and vice versa, right? So my parts are located where I am located. So how does it happen if the whole and the parts are strictly uh, distinct entities? How does it come if that when my parts actually leave the room, I leave the room? So it's, it seems that you need to offer an explanation for this. Now, composition as identity theories to have a straightforward explanation. Well, your parts are you, so if they leave, you leave the room. 
Another reason is that the answers to traditional um, metaphysical questions about composition, the general composition question, what well, is composition, is just identity, and the special composition question, roughly, what well, are the sufficient and necessary conditions a plurality of objects have to meet in order to compose a farther object? And it answers that because a lot of people, but I know that there are people in that room that do not think so, and I'm one of them, so that composition as identity entails metodological universalism, the view that um, any non-empty plurality whatsoever compose a farther object. So now I happen to think that this is a good answer to the special composition question. So that would be a plus. And on top of that, it would give reason actually to grant a wish to Diderot and uh, a wish that he expresses in, in this magnificent magnificent letter to Sophie Volan. I'll give you a little bit of time to read the passage, especially in italics. Diderot actually is wishing that he and, and Sophie could be buried together, close together, so that maybe their hashes, the particles, could compose a common being after their long dead. I think this is uh, incredibly beautiful, incredibly moving. And of course, meteorological universalism will grant Diderot his final wish. I think this is reason enough to accept it, but that's me, I'm a sucker for these things. Um, and now, since we are on the literary track, I think that there's another literary reason to actually engage seriously with composition as identity, and it has to do with William Shakespeare. Sorry. So remember, King Lear. So King Lear divides the kingdom in three parts, right? And gives and gives the parts away to, to, to his daughters. Now it just so happens that now he divides it really in two because Cordelia, we all know, um, with his the beautiful Adagio Cordelia, love and be silent, does not tell Lear how much she loves him, therefore he actually she, she's left with nothing. So let's say that Lear divides the kingdom in two. So he gives the northern part to Regan, he gives the southern part to Goneril. So the question is, could Lear have retained the whole kingdom to himself? And thus avoiding the tragedy? Well, according to composition as identity, he could not have, right? Why? Well, the parts considered collectively are the kingdom. The kingdom is the parts. So when Lear gives the parts away, it gives the, the kingdom away. He cannot say, well, you rule over the northern part, Regan, you rule over the, the southern part, Goneril, but I am the kingdom of the whole. Okay? So the thought here is that if composition as identity was blatantly true, the tragedy of King Lear could have been avoided right from the start. But who actually knows it that it's not blatantly false? It's actually who, who is the character that endorses composition as identity? It's one of the greatest characters in the Western literature, is the fool. So the fool, actually, immediately after this, uh, this passage, they're, 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 having, they're having a huge lunch. And so the fool comes and he jokes with, with Lear, and then he has this magnificent um, uh, response to a Lear question. Well, he says, well, after I cut the egg in the middle and eat up the meat, the two crowns of the egg. When the clovers thy crown in the middle and gives away both parts, the boast thine eyes on thy back over the dirt. So the fool seems to know right, that when he gave away the, both the parts, he gave away the whole kingdom. So now the argument might be the following. If composition is identity is just blatantly false, we would not have had King Lear. And a world without King Lear is really not a world worth living in, right? So we should think seriously about that. So that's my favorite reason, basically. Okay, so let's be a little bit more rigorous now uh, after these preliminary uh, remarks. So a little bit more rigorously, composition is identity is the thesis that core logical and semantical principles of orthodox one-to-one -one identity can be extended to composition. Okay, now, what are these, um, these logical principles? Usually we, th we think there are two at least. So 
the identity is an equivalence relation. In fact, it is the smallest equivalence relation on the universal domain. So it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, and it obeys the Leibniz law. In particular, we will focus on one direction of the Leibniz law, which is the indiscernibility of identicals. Uh, both are supposed to hold for orthodox one-to-one -one identity and plural identity, that is, many-many identity, many-one identity, or one-many identity. This is what you need to actually um, even formulate the thesis that a whole is identical to many things, the parts. Okay? So now, the, 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 the two principles, of course, are related. In fact, usually, if I remember correctly, we axiomatize first-order logic with identity, with just reflexivity and a schema for the Leibniz law. So, as far as I know, no one seriously uh, called into question equivalence, but a little, some people, especially Baxter, called into question uh, indiscernibility of identicals in, in, in this context. But here is, so for example, Sider on the Leibniz law. Defenders of strong composition as identity must accept Leibniz law because to deny it, it would arouse suspicion that it's not identity they're talking about. And here is Megan Wallace, which is one of the philosophers that actually endorses this, uh, the, the strong view of composition as identity. She's pretty clear. Hybrid identity, as she calls it, is transitive, reflexive, and symmetric, so the equivalence part, and it obeys the Leibniz law. The exception is that hybrid identity allows us to claim that many things can be identical to a singular thing. What about the semantics? Now, recently, uh, there, uh, there's been a few papers uh, on the semantics of uh, true identity statements in relation to composition as identity, and the core semantical principle they um, all discuss is the following. It's called co-referentiality. Terms of a true identity statement must be co-referential. And here is a recent paper by two Italian philosophers, Carrara and Landu, to the point that uh, every semantics of um, true identity statements actually should respect co-referentiality. In fact, they actually conclude that co-referentiality should be seen as a constraint on the debate on strong composition as identity. Okay, so we will take that for granted. So now, my first aim is to argue that no version of strong composition as identity can retain the logical principles in one in their full strength, and as a result, no version of strong composition as identity can retain the semantical principle in three. Okay, now, so what follows is very, very, it's just very orthodox. So if you know Mariology, you can do whatever you want, like, you know, listen to your iPod, uh, read um, the new passage from Cormac McCarthy novel, whatever you want. Uh, this is just orthodox, nothing new is going on here. But for those of you um, in, in the public that I don't know how much Mariology they know, here's what you usually um, um, we usually do to actually even frame composition as identity, which is seven uh, below. So four is the definition. So you, you take parthood uh, as primitive and you define proper parthood. This is four. So X is a proper part of Y. If X is part of Y and X is distinct from Y. Then you define overlap in five. Overlap just means sharing of parts. Two things overlap if there, is a, there exists a part that they have in common. And then you, you have a notion of fusion so this is a kind of a strong notion um, of fusion. Says so the X is the fusion of the Y's uh, double sign stand for so-called plural variables. Uh, and the definition is every part, uh, so every member of the Y's is a part of the fusion. That's the first conjunct. And the se second conjunct of six says that every part of the fusion overlaps at least one of the Y's. This is how formal you require it. But this is just um, uh, a very you know, orthodox notion of fusion. Uh, so you, you might think uh, of this definition in the following way. The first conjunct, right, every Y's is part of the fusion as you have the gather conjunct. Gather all the Y's together. Don't leave anything out. And the second conjunct, like every part of the fusion should overlap at least one of the Y's as the minimize. Take the smallest thing that has all the wisest parts. Okay, small is not a meteorological predicate, so you have to actually be clever enough to, um, to actually define it in purely meteorological terms, and that's what the second conjugate does. Um, so now composition as identity, straightforwardly, is seven. This is a very, very strong version of composition as identity. It says 
Well, let's read it together. Um, so if x fuses the y, x is identical to the y. So suppose i fuses uh, the plurality of my bodily organs, i am identical with my bodily organs. That's what composition as identity, or strong composition as identity, if you want, uh, tells you. Okay? Good. So this is enough for, um, let's say, stage setting. Let's dive in into the argument. So the argument are divided in two. We're going to see a logical failure to the point that strong composition as identity cannot retain uh, the logical principles and the semantical failure to the point that composition as identity cannot retain even the semantical principle on true identity statement. Uh, so let's start with the first. So the logical failure. So here, here's what I'm going to argue and what I'm going to prove with you. So if identity is an equivalence relation, the left to right direction of principle number eight fades. Let's read principle number eight. Principle number eight informally says that if the x's are identical to the y's, so, so it's identity for pluralities basically, are identical if and only if the pluralities have the same members. You see, every member of the x is a member of the y and vice versa. Okay. So, here's why I think that um, composition as identity cannot retain the left to right direction of eight. There are two different arguments, two independent arguments. First one, consider my body, B, its molecules, MM, and its atoms, AA. So, of course, my body fuses my molecules. Okay, so you have F, BMM, as you can see here in the slide. And of course, it also fuses my atoms, right? So you also have that my body fuses uh, the plurality of the atoms. Now, by composition as identity applied to one and two there, you get the my body is identical to the molecules and my body is identical to the atoms. Now, by symmetry and transitivity of identity, you get the molecules or the atoms are identical to the atoms. So these pluralities are identical. And by the left to right direction of eight, what you get is that the plurality of the molecules and the plurality of the atoms have the same members. But of course that means, and this is exactly what we're going to actually discuss a little bit more thoroughly in what follows, it follows that each atom is a molecule and each molecule is an atom, which seems false. Okay. So composition as identity seems to entail that the right, the left, I'm sorry, the left to right direction of eight fails. So here's the, this is one argument. A second argument is a little bit more convoluted, but it's, I think it's more significant because of its consequences. Um, I'm going to argue that um, the, the left to right direction of eight together with composition as identity entails the following principle, which is known in the literature as collapse which is 9 above, and let's read Collapse. Collapse says that if x fuses the y, then uh, every, everything which is among the plurality of the y's is a meteorological part of, of, um, of the fusion x, and vice versa. So it just says, it's called Collapse because it collapses, actually, the being one of the relation from plural logic to the part of the relation, okay? So it just, it just says that to be a member of a particular plurality is for it to be part of the meteorological fusion of, of the pluralities. Why it is bad? Well, consider the example we started with, uh, the body, my body and uh, the fusion um, of its molecules. Can you say that? Well, the thought is, wait a minute, given nine, it would entail that all the parts of my body are molecules, right? Because it would entail that all the parts of my body, right, are members of the plurality, the molecules of my body. So it seemed to entail that all the parts of my body are molecules, which is really false, right? My, my heart, which is part of my body, clearly is not a molecule. So I'm going to actually prove for you that um, the the left to right direction of eight together with composition as identity really entails nine. 
So to do that, you need first to prove a principle of plural logic, which is called plural covering. Now, you may assume it right from the start, but I think we can prove it. So let's prove the, that thing too. So look at, look at plural covering is 10. So look at what plural covering is saying. It's saying that if y is part of x, then there is a fusion, then there is a plurality, sorry, of w's such that x, the guy on the right of the, of, of the antecedent, fuses that plurality, and the guy on the left is among uh, the members of that plurality. So he, here's an example. Look, suppose my, my hand, my right hand, is part of my body, then there is a plurality such that my body fuses that plurality and my hand is a member of that plurality. Let's say, for example, the, the plurality of my bodily parts. Okay? So it seems pretty plausible, but it, it, you, you can actually prove it. And in fact, I'm going to prove it for you. Um, so assume the antecedent of, of 10. So assume that y is part of x. I'm, I'm, I'm going through the proof. And let w's be the plurality um, the following plurality, things that are rather x or y. So, so basically, in the w's are just x and y. Okay. So now, if the if the if the the w's are just x and y, of course you have the second conjunct of the plural covering principle of the consequent of the plural covering. Right from the start, right y is among the w's in fact the w's are just x and y so you only need to prove that the x fuses the w okay so you just need to check that x actually um qualifies as a metallurgical fusion how you do it well you go back to the definition of fusion and you check that both of the conjuncts are satisfied i'm doing that for you so the first say that the first remember is the gathering conjunct each of the w's is part of the of, of x well, of course they are, right? Why? Well, Y is part of X. So remember, the W's are just X and Y. Y is part of X by assumption, and X is part of X by reflexivity of part. So the first, you have the first conjunct, the, let's say, gathering conjunct. What about the minimizing conjunct? Every part, that, say, that conjunct says that every part of X should overlap at least one of the W's. Does it? Of course it does. Why? Because, of course, every part of X overlaps X. And X is among the W's. In fact, the W's are just X and Y. So you just proved, actually, plural covering. And in what follows, I will show you that plural covering, the, the, right, the left to right direction of 8, and composition as an entity entails collapse. And it's... Okay. So here's the proof. So I, I wrote for you collapse again before the proof as you can see collapse so it has it has an antecedent and then the consequent is um a biconditional so what i'm going to do for you is i'm going to assume the antecedent and i'm going to actually prove both the direction of the biconditional so the left to right direction of the biconditional is trivial so we're going to do that first so what you assume you assume that x is the fusion of the y's and you assume also the left to right direction of the, of the biconditional of the consequent, that is, you assume that Z is among the Y. If Z is among the Y, then Z is part, uh, is part of X by definition of fusion. Okay? So you have actually the, the consequent um, so of, of the left to right uh, direction. By, def by simple definition of fusion. Now, the, the, the trickier, but j just slightly trickier part is the right to left. So you still assume that X fuses the Y, but now you assume that Z is part of X, and you want to prove that Z is among the Ys. Okay? So look at, at, look at, at, at the assumption. Z is part of X. Now, if you remember correctly, Z is, Z is part of X actually is the antecedent of the plural covering principle, right? So you can apply it. Remember what it says. If Z is part of X, it says that there is a plurality such that the guy on the left, the part, is among that plurality, and the guy on the right, the whole, let's say, fuses that plurality. So it says that there are W such that X fuses the W, right? And Z is among the W. So now, take two, X fuses the W. By composition as an entity, of course, you have that X 
equals the w right that is just composition as identity but of course you also assumed right from the start that x fuses the y's so by composition as identity applied to that you get that x equals the y's now by equivalence that is uh, symmetry and transitivity basically you get that the y's right are identical to the um, to the w's now this is just the antecedent if you remember of the left uh, of, of of eight that that says that if two pluralities are identical they have the same members okay so now since z is among um, the w by three there you have that since they have the same members z is among the y's as well which is exactly what you what we were trying to prove so now we do have collapse okay so we have that if x fuses the y's okay to be among the plurality of the y's is is just to be part of the meteorological fusion of the y okay why is this problematic so you might think that it's problematic right in itself right exactly because it seems to entail that you cannot say i mean the composition of identity theories cannot say that i am the fusion of um, of of the molecules of my body but he, i think that the problem is a little bit deeper in fact contrary to widespread agreement I believe that this entails meteorological nihilism. So this is the cool argument we are going to actually focus on now. So meteorological nihilism is um, uh, the view that uh, nothing composes anything whatsoever. There are just atoms. So I'm not here. There are just atoms arranged cloudy-wise. Of course, you are not there as well, right? I mean, so we do not exist, strictly speaking. A, bit, a little bit more rigorously, but just a little bit, so define an atom as in 11 as a thing that does not have any proper parts then meteorological nihilism says that everything is an atom okay so i'm going to prove you that um, composition as identity entails collapse and collapse entails meteorological nihilism so now i i've, I've given this argument quite a few times now and uh, some people in the audience have listened to that quite a few times now so um, I actually did a new proof just so they don't have to sit through the old arguments. So here's the new proof. Um, composition as identity entails the following principle called weak company, which is a very, very weak principle of supplementation. Let's read it together. Um, it says that if X is a proper part of Y, then there is a proper part of Y that is distinct from X. It just says that everything that is a proper part has another proper part which is distinct. So usually you're probably more familiar with the weak supplementation principle and where, where the second conjunct is just meteorological disjointness. It's not numerical distinctness. Okay. Here's the proof. So this is a very, very weak supplementation principle. So here's the proof. Suppose this is not the case. Okay. So what you get is that you still have composition as identity and then you have the antecedent of weak company. So you have something that acts as, as a proper part of Y, but um, you don't have the consequent. Okay, so there is no other proper part of Y. So X is the only proper part of Y. Okay. So now Y is clearly the fusion of all and only Y's proper parts. But Y has just one proper part, X, right, by assumption. Now, by composition as identity, this entails that x equals y. But of course, from 2 is x, if x is a proper part of y, this entails by definition of proper part that x is distinct from y. You get a contradiction, therefore you get the composition as identity entails weak company. In fact, actually entails stronger uh, supplementation principles. But it's easy to run the argument for weak company. So now I'm going to argue that collapse entails meteorological nihilism. Okay. Okay. Here's the proof. Suppose that X is a proper part of Y. Right? We already saw, right, that Y is the fusion of the following plurality, right? Things that are either X or Y. 
We already saw that when we were actually uh, proving plural covering, but you can check it for yourself. So now by collapse, each part of Y is among the W's, right? So it's among the things that are either X or Y. So each part of Y is either identical to X or it is identical to Y. Now, since every, every proper part then of Y is identical to X, right? Because so if, 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 that's, if that's so, there is no such part, uh, proper part of Y, Z, such that is a proper part of Y and distinct from X. And this actually contradicts with company, right? But we company follows from chi. So there is no X such that X is a proper part of Y. By generalization, you get methodological nihilism. The thought here, here's the, the more informal argument. So composition as identity together with um, um, the assumption that there is at least a composite object is equivalent to the fact that there is something that has a proper part um, entails both we company in its negation via collapse. So on pain of inconsistency, composition as identity should entail that there are no composite objects whatsoever. That is, it entails metrological nihilism. Okay, so here's the option. Composition as identity entails collapse uh, given the left to right direction of eight, which is the, uh, um, uh, the principle, let, 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 let's, let, let's recall it, that says that um, two pluralities are identical if, they, if and only if they have the same members, okay? And this entails metrological nihilism. So I think that it's, um, it's fair to say that the upshot of the argument is that friends of composition as identity better give up the left to right direction of eight, okay? Because otherwise, either they f f fall prey um, to the first argument, to the point that m the molecules of my body are, are identical to the atoms of my body. Uh, each molecule is identical to, to an atom. Or actually you end up with atoms alone. Um, which a few composition as an anti theorist would want. So you better give up the left to right direction of 8. Because all these arguments depend crucially on that principle. But the problem is of course that 8 is just an instance of the Leibniz law. In particular it is an instance of the indiscernibility of identicals. In fact, if you actually take the standard, let's say, reference on plural logic, Oliver and Smiley, eight is basically uh, the definition of, um, it's basically the, Leibniz, the plural Leibniz law, okay? So it seems that the, the argument established that no version of strong composition as identity can retain the full strength of both the logical principles in one and two. So this is, this I call the logical failure argument. What about semantics? Well, the semantical failure is a failure of co-referentiality. That is the principle that the, the expressions of a true identity statement must be co-referential. Now, failure of co-referentiality should be expected. Why? Well, Leibniz law is intimately related with substitutivity of identicals, and substitutivity of identicals is in turn a test, let's say for co-referentiality. Here's a classic passage of Quine which actually collapses all of, all, all of these notions, but it's a beautiful passage nonetheless. Here it is. One of the fundamental principles governing identity is that of substitutivity, or as it might well be called, indiscernibility of identicals. It provides that, given a true identity statement, one of its two terms may be substituted for the other in any true statement, and the result will be true. Okay, but of course, uh, you, you, you cannot meet this requirement if you have the logical failure, um, in fact. And here's the argument for that. So let, let, let's pick up a version of substitutivity of identicals. Uh, I took it from a standard textbook in linguistics. The su substitutivity of identical substitut substitution of one co-referential expression for another does not affect the truth value of a sentence in non-opaque contexts. So now, Suppose that 8 fails, that is, um, the left to right direction of 8 fails. This is what the logical uh, failure argument allegedly establishes, right? 
So what we have, we can have actually two pluralities that are identical, but they do not have the same members. That's what it, that's what it says, right? So, so what you get is, is, is the following claim on the slides. So you have that the x's are the y's, z is among the x's, but z is not among the y's. Okay? Now, claim, the first claim, x, the, the x's are identical to the y's, gives us a true identity statement. By coreferentiality, the axis and the y's should be coreferential. Now, right? So by substitutivity of identicals, substitu substitution preserves truth. You should be able to substitute axis to the y's or y's to the axis and do not alter the truth, um, the truth value of, of particular sentences. Now, but of course, if you do that in two or three, okay, you will alter the truth value. Okay. Uh, so this just very simple argument. Uh, shows that once you have the logical failure, the semantical failure, you know, just goes along. And I think that that's what you should have expected all along, given the, the ties um, between the two. So this I call the failure argument. It's a two-part argument to the point that composition, a strong version of composition as identity, cannot retain both the logical principles and the semantical principle uh, governing orthodox one-to-one -one identity. Now, they seem pretty straightforward, but um, lately I've been, I've been come to, to think that actually both the arguments uses an implicit assumptions about pluralities and, um, and the semantics of plural failing expressions. And in fact, this can and probably should, if you are a friend of composition as identity, should be challenged. I'm not a fan of the, of the strong version of composition as identity because of reason coming from... Um, physics, um, and I, I saw that there's an, 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 a fantastic talk on composition um, and, and emergence on, based on, 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 quantum, on, on quantum physics, so uh, I, I, I kind of am sympathetic with this kind of, 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 of arguments. Um, but so in, in the following, I will just focus on the logic part. I, I will not focus on the semantics anymore because it, it would be too long. Okay, so the, the thing, so, how to tackle this? So, usually composition as identity theorists have gone, um, when faced not with these arguments, these arguments are fairly new in the, um, so, uh, in, in the literature, I mean, uh, I've, I've, I've been published that the last year, so it's not like, so usually they actually try to get a hold on a fix, on a very specific fix um, of, um, you know, composition as identity in order to actually um, deal with with the with, the arg with some arguments uh, against composition as identity. Uh, I want to take another approach. Um, I call it the Dr. Rouse approach. Um, so why the Dr. Rouse? You shouldn't. So the first thing you should do it's not. It's actually look at what the symptoms are telling you and actually find a diagnosis. Um, so once you have the diagnosis, why composition as identity faces these particular threats, okay, then and only then you should actually um, uh, try to, you know, uh, fix a um, few things here and there. Uh, because that, that then you, you, you have cured, let's say, uh, the common, um, not just the symptoms, but the, you know, the real medical um, cause of the problem. The idea, and I'm working with this with Thomas Sattig, uh, is that what is philosophically important about composition is identity, is what it does not say. It's not what it says explicitly, but what it does not say. It's not what it reveals, it what it's blind to. And what it's blind to is blind, is it, composition is identity is blind to structure. It is in fact blind to different kinds of structure, sortal structure, topological structure, metric structure, and so on. Why? Well, for example, arrangements of parts, the topological arrangement of parts, being connected, disconnected, compact, not compact, so on and so forth, are irrelevant for identity. Metrical structure is irrelevant for identity, and sortal structure is irrelevant for identity. It does not matter at all what kind of sortals the parts fall under, okay? So, 
composition as identity is in fact blind to all sorts of kind, uh, all, all, uh, all sorts of structures. Why is this important here? The thought is the following, is that collapse and the collapse and the plural identity arguments, the arguments that we just saw, right, the, the logical failure argument, are implicitly underpinned by a particular metaphysics of pluralities that on the other hand is not uh, uh, completely blind to structure. Hence the tension. You have a metaphysical theory, metaphysical thesis, composition as that is completely blind to structure. On the other hand, somehow you have arguments that use as principle that are not completely blind to structure. Hence the tension. If you actually looked at the diagnosis, you should have actually expected the tension. That was not a marriage made in heaven. I mean, they can go along for a few um, for a few days, but then you know, eventually, since they're so different that actually the tension will eventually come to the surface. Now, why it is important? It is important because the diagnose this diagnosis, if it's correct, it might very well be the you know we're completely wrong might help friends of composition as identity. Because once you have your diagnosis, that is what Dr. House did all the time, right? You can develop a, a substantive cure. Not just a cure that cures the symptoms, but a cure that but a cure that actually goes at the root of the problem. And we think that this is a new metaphysics of plurality that is more in line with classical metallurgical blindness. Uh, and of course, once you have that, you should also go for a particular semantics of plural referring expressions, but we will not go into that. So here are some tentative suggestions. Uh, so you can use and extend fine theory of part to, have a, to get a hold on sensitivity of some composition and the composition relations to structure, because now it's just a very vague uh, notion of, oh, they're sensitive to structure or they're blind to structure then argue that pluralities are modeled via decomposition principles along well, principles which are called comprehension principles that are very similar to naive set theoretical principles that are not actually um, uh, blind uh, to, to, to structure but to particular kind of structure and then show that composition is identity instead uh, is blind to the relevant structure in question. So here's, for example, what find us. This is for composition relation. So you have absorption, for example, collapse, equally collapse. We call collapse something else, but I mean, there's, there's no genuine risk of ambiguity here. Leveling and permutation. So for example, so find starts with a building relation, which you call sigma, and it says different building relation obeys different axioms. So for example, um, the, the building relation of cl general classical meteorology, that is basically meteorological fusion, obeys all of them. Obeys absorption, collapse, leveling, and permutation. So, for example, look at collapse. If you fuse something with itself, you just get, you just get the thing you started from. Okay? So, meteorological fusion does obey collapse. But, for example, set theory formation does not. If you take an element and you build a singleton, right, set theoretically, you get a different thing. And if you, if, if you build from the singleton, the singleton of the singleton, of course, you build another thing. So it doesn't obey. So the, the set theoretic building relation doesn't obey collapse. That's, so it's sensitive to, um, to this particular kind of structure. Another way of putting it, it's not that important, for example. So, um, or look at permutation. So permutation encodes some sort of sensibility um, to order, okay? So, for example, if you fuse my, my left hand and my right hand, you get the same thing as if you fuse the left hand and the right hand. The order does not count. But suppose that you are David Armstrong and you think that there is a particular non meteorological building relation for facts, right? Now, the meteorological building relation for facts should be actually sensitive to um, order, right? Because uh, the fact that I love um, Natalie Portman is very different, unfortunately, from the fact that um, Natalie Portman loves me. In fact, I, the, the first one obtains, and I'm very skeptical about the second. But of course, uh, meteorological uh, uh, composite, meteorological fusion does obey permutation. So the thought is that different, Fine has this view that different um, 
building relations are sensitive to different sorts of structures. So uh, a, a composition relation that does not obey permutation is, is sensitive to order, for example. Okay, so we can use this kind of insight to argue that even decomposition relations can be actually um, sensitive to different kind of structures. Here it is. So consider a given portion of reality, okay? We will just take a very, very simple thing, a very, sim a very simple square, for example. So that, that portion of reality, right, can be carved up, can be decomposed in different ways. Now, comprehension principles that you might know from second order, um, second order logic, but uh, you have uh, composite comprehension principles for plural logic as well, are sort of the composition relations for plural logic. The orthodox one that is endorsed, this is the most orthodox one, uh, is 19, which is just called comprehension principle, is the following. It says, well, if there is just uh, an F, if there is at least one F, there is a plurality of things, okay, such that to be among them, you have to be an F. So, given that there is at least an F, okay, there is plurality that contains all and only the things that are F. Okay? So this is loosely based upon the naive comprehension principles of set theory. Remember, the naive comprehension principle says that for each predicate f, there is a set of all and only the f's. Now, the thing is that we want to argue, uh, we're still unclear how to do it, but it seems that 19 encodes a particular uh, sensitivity to a particular form of structure, sort of structure, because the predicate f actually plays a crucial role. And in fact, I'm going to give you an example of that. This actually, this sensitivity to structure coupled with the plural identity, which is cached out by eight in terms of sameness of members, and takes the different decomposition gives you different pluralities. And the members of, of those pluralities fall under different sortals. That is why it's sensitive to sortal structure. So look at the, at the, at the slide 22 and look at, 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 at the big square. Okay, let me... Cheers. Okay, so take the big square, and so the big square is composed, let's say, of four small squares, one, two, three, and four, each of which has um, a one meter side. So take the following three predicates. F1 is being a one meter side square, F2 is being a rectangle, and F3 is being bow tie shaped. Now, if you divide the portion of reality, the big square portion of reality, via comprehension principles where you plug in this, um, the F1 to F3 predicates, what you get is a very, very different um, way of decomposing the, um, the big square. In fact, if you use this, um, okay, let, let, let's go back. So if you use F1, what you get is 1, 2, 3, and 4. Right? Because the, these are the only things that actually are square of one meter side. Suppose that you get uh, being a rectangle, so you pick being a rectangle. What you get is, of course, 12, which is the fusion of 1 and 2, 34, which is the fusion on 3 and 4, 13, which is the fusion of 1 and 3, and 24, which is the fusion of 2 and 4. Um, of course, 24 and 42 are just the same thing, um, especially given composition as identity. So now, if you pick F3, what you get is you, you get 14, the fusion of 1 and 4, and 23, the fusion of 2 and 3. In fact, that's exactly what I've written in the, ne in, in the next slide. So, if you use the comprehension principles, which encodes the sensibility to the predicate F, which you pick to divide actually the, the, the portion of reality you started from, what you get is the plurality P1, the plurality P2, the plurality P3. Now, as you can see immediately, those pluralities have different members. Now, if you apply plural identity, that is, if you apply 8, basically, what you get is that these uh, pluralities are different, right? Because plural identity just says that uh, having the same members is both sufficient and necessary for uh, identity, for plural identity. Instead, if you actually use the composition principles of plural logic, right, 
because of the because of the sensitivity of the decomposition relation, right, the via comprehension principle, to sort a structure, you get different pluralities. Of course, composition as identity is in fact blind to all this. Why? Well, insofar as these pluralities have the same fusion, okay, composition as identity will actually conflate them. Will actually say that one and the same pluralities. So you should have expected uh, the tension. You know? So that's the diagnosis that we have in mind. So um, if you use the resources of orthodox plural logic and the composition principle and comprehension principles of plural logic, they encode sensitivity to particular kinds of structure that is not actually witnessed in the composition as identity. So you should uh, construct your pluralities differently. In particular, you should have a, a, a metaphysics of pluralities and consequently a semantics for plural defending expression, which is completely blind to structure. And we're going to suggest um, a few things. Uh, we're still very, very um, rough here uh, because we, we're still toying with different uh, suggestions. So, but the, 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 you know, the upshot is that friends of composition and identity should develop an alternative metaphysics of pluralities. One that is blind to levels, sortals. Our thought is that it should be close. So the plurality of F, of Fs, should be close under probably arbitrary fusions of Fs and probably under arbitrary decompositions of Fs into parts. Uh, we're still unclear about to really cash it out rigorously, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to put forward the suggestion on the table and then maybe if you have any insights, you get an acknowledgement in the paper. This will go actually well with some claims in Cotton Noir and Cider to the point that we have to consider partitions um, when we deal with composition as identity. In fact, for example, um, composition as generalized identity, as Cotton uh, suggests, I think so. He uses the composition. He uses set theory um, at a certain point, um, and he uses partitions uh, in in set theoretic terms. But it's not by chance that actually he ends up uh, giving up eight. Um, so this is reason for me and Thomas to think that you know this kind of uh, this line of thought is on the right track. And also Sider consider different comprehension principles that um, are most, let's say, in line, more in line with um, composition as identity as a metaphysical thesis. So there might be something there. So the rough suggestions uh, still is the following. So the plurality of Fs right, contain members as members the following. Things that are F, parts of things that are F, and fusions of parts of things that are F. Now we're talking with different things. So we're talking, for example, of fusions of things that are F. You can think that. Or you can think the fusions of parts. Um, I think it's probably fusions of parts of things that are F is better, but we really need to actually um, go and do some formal work for that, I, I, I guess. Why does this help, though? Here's why. The following, the, the following claims, which are plausible enough, and actually, in effect, they follow from the orthodox comprehension principles of full plural logic, turn out to be false. So, um, but they are implicit actually in the plural identity and the collapse arguments. So here's, for example, 20. 20 says that for every x, if x is among the plurality of the atoms, then it is an atom. And 21 say for every x, if x is among the members of the the plurality of the molecules, X is a molecule. So these are pretty plausible um, claims, actually, uh, in and on themselves. And in effect, they straightforwardly follow from the comprehension principles. Okay? So the plurality of atoms contains just atoms, the plurality of molecules contains just molecules. Um, but, of course, if you have a, a, a metaphysical plurality that says the plurality of F does not contain only F as members, it contains also fusions of things that are F, and maybe fusions of parts of things that are F, right? It follows that the plurality of atoms, of course, can contain some molecule. 
Because if you fuse a, little, a few atoms together, you end up with a molecule. The same goes for molecules, right? If you think that the pluralities have parts of things, uh, the plurality of molecules um, have as members uh, parts of things that are molecules, so they can have atoms as, as, as members, right? And in fact, this would solve actually the, uh, the would actually resist, would help you resist the logical failure argument. And if you resist the logical failure argument, I, I think it's straightforward to resist also the, the semantical failure. We'll just say, so for example, re recall the first argument, right? I said, well, my, my molecules are my atoms, therefore, you know, each of the molecule uh, is an atom. Well, that was underpinned, the implicit premises there, that the, the plurality of molecules contains all the molecules as members. But if you have this new version of pluralities, of course, the plurality of molecules probably have some atoms as members. And the plurality of atoms have some molecules um, as members because they are just fusions of atoms. The same thing, if you actually work through that, um, um, say, say, saves composition as identity from the threat of collapse as well. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you as, 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 as an exercise. Okay, so now to conclude, because um, I think I already took a little bit of your time with, with, with the video. Um, let me sip again a little bit. So to conclude, now I believe, to be honest, that there are different arguments from very specific versions of composition as identity, the one that we saw today, so that as uh, the, the strong composition as identity that actually has only the orthodox resources, doesn't have, for example, counterpart theory, as Shizlan uh, uses it. Um, I think that there are actually different arguments from composition as identity to methodological nihilism that do not involve pluralities and plural failing expressions. So I think that this is still a threat. In fact, I myself work on one such argument and this argument crucially depends on the full strength of the Leibniz law and on an unabashed use of the unrestricted substitutivity schema. So if you restrict the substitutivity schema, my argument will not go through it. Um, but I think that the previous work on pluralities and, plus, and plural referring expression is still important. Because there are different methodological theses about composition that are strictly weaker than composition as identity. The one that I have in mind is extensionalism which I would, I, I'm fatally attracted to the extensionalism. I think that, for example, um, we have reasons coming from physics to, to think that um, extensionalism all true even in the quantum domain. Um, so I think we should, we should actually stick to extensionalism. Um, and, but even extensionalism actually has the same blindness to structure as composition as identity. But it's true that it's strictly speaking uh, weaker in the sense that composition as identity entails extensionalism, but the converse does not hold. Extensionalism does not entail composition as identity. So the previous work on pluralities and plural and defending expressions, I think it's worth um, developing, uh, even if you are not uh, going to endorse composition as identity, I have independent reasons for not endorsing in the strong version. That's another story. And hopefully, I think, and I will leave you with that, uh, is that um, if you do a little bit of this, of this work, maybe you can uh, come up with um, an understanding of this beautiful yet very strange passage. Uh, here it is to the point that you can add up the parts, but you won't have the sum. This is, this is saying something even different from the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And I've never quite understood what it means. And um, hopefully, if you understand that, then, then you can actually get to the final lines in this beautiful thing which I think in our dark age we should all cling on to
to this line that say that there is a crack, a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. And uh, with this anthem by Leonard Cohen, I will actually leave you. Thank you for uh, staying with me, even if I could not be there in person. Um, I wish I could have been there, but um, hopefully there will be other occasions. And, you know, go read, read the Diderot, go read um, King Lear again, and listen to Leonard Cohen before you go to bed tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll see each other soon in person.